Today's YouTube video is going to say process haters for some reason. The name didn't change when I entered in the data, so it'll there'll be three classes <laughs> process haters till I change it. So just go by the date. Okay. <laughs> and we'll hope to have an instructor today, otherwise it's <laughs> another free day. That's Bruce Willis. Half the same thing happened to the same guy twice. <laughs> Could have an impromptu talent show. Yep, yep. Power cord's right over there. Your HDMI is right there. For your laptop. I'm amazed. Not yet. Yeah, I want to tell them state. Then your uh, hotel microphone's on there if you just want to clip that up. Uh, close to your neck area and then just kick the button back wherever you can. There's a switch on the top, turn it all the way to one side. So okay. I can help you that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if he's going to show up. <laughs> Sorry. I missed him be here earlier. We have one instructor that's already been missing in action. Oh no. So I just started it early. Is there somewhere I need to stand specifically? Uh, just right there uh, between uh, the table, at, well, right there where your computer's at to the left of this screen right here. I'll line it up right quick. Son? Yep. Hey. Right here, good? <laughs> 
Jacob. Just give me a little voice test. Test, test. Good to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Sorry I ran a little late there. Got lost on the way over here. But I guess there's another hall. Kaplan Hall? Is that what it is? I put that into my phone. I got it down there. Anyways, I found it. I have your test here from Chuck. If some of you were not here last week, we can hand those out at the end of the hour. And then I also have the sign-in sheet. You probably want that, don't you? I'll take that back to... Do you call him Dr. Bokel, Chuck? Yeah, yes. Okay, sorry, I should say Dr. Bokel. Um, but I'm, my name is Sherry Roberts. I am not a doctor, so you can call me Sherry or whatever you want to call me. I am an applications engineer in our Flare Aftermarket Group at John Zink in Tulsa. So I work over at our Tulsa campus. I sell process flares equipment. So Dr. Bokel is more of an expert in the burner field. I actually deal with flares, process flares, which are in refineries, petrochemicals, chemical plants all over the world, offshore platforms. Um, so I work with all of those. So I'm going to start the flare discussion today. Um, my supervisor, Chris Foster, is going to be here on Thursday to finish the discussion. So does anybody know what a flare is? Has anybody ever seen a flare? We got a couple of heads shaking. If you drive out by the Holly Refinery, you'll see one lighting up the sky, especially at nighttime. So basically a flare is there to relieve the pressure from any of the process units in the plants. In the early days, we didn't have flares. Basically, they just vented all of that gas to atmosphere. Anything that came out of the, the process units, it was vented to atmosphere. The issue with that is, as those gases, they find an ignition source, whether it be lightning, static electricity, some type of, of ignition source at grade, a lot of times these gases are heavier than air, so they actually come to grade and find an ignition source. What happens then? A boom, right? Catastrophic fires, hurting people, killing people in many situations, causing great equipment damage. So our goal was to actually, we had need to light this gas as it exits the flare, and then we move from venting to flaring. So what we want to see is this gas is lighting off. A lot of the public don't understand this. They see this as pollution. Um, so that's a, a real big issue that we fight in today's industry is that neighbors don't want to see flares because they think that this is pollution. Whereas really, if you're not burning this gas, you're polluting the environment. So our goal is to make sure the flares are lit at all times. The US EPA actually started regulated venting in around 1947. So that's when we really started shifting from venting to atmosphere to flaring. How do we create change event from event to a flare? You have to provide an ignition source. Today's ignition sources are called pilots, um, which is what you see here. So this is a flare pilot. They are mounted on the side of a flare tip. They provide a constant ignition source at all times, so they should be lit at all times. They have to be stable in high wind and rain conditions. We have many, many plants on the Gulf Coast refinery, so they see hurricane type conditions. The flare is one part of the refinery that you can't shut down until everything else is shut down. So anytime when these hurricanes hit and they shut down process units, the flares still have to stay lit. The pilots still have to stay lit to make sure that gas is all combusted safely. So it's very important. Um, many pilots are tested in excess of 150 miles per hour to stay lit in those conditions in over 20 inches per hour of rainfall. So very high wind and rain resistance. Another way to light a flare has been done in the past. We got a short little video here to show you. If you don't have a constant pilot lit, one way to light it, we can get a bow and arrow back out. <laughs> light it on fire, take a shot at it, take your best shot. Does anybody do archery in here? A little bit? I don't think I'd want to be responsible for that. Goes all the way up. Is it gonna make it up there? Oh, it just barely missed it. It's not gonna light off the gas. Oh, there's a process unit. Where are you at? Where are you shooting towards? People definitely don't want that. So let's try again. We missed that one. Oh, oh man. Just goes on and on, right? Which, if there's a vapor cloud up there, it's probably going to light a little faster than that. But this guy over here, not in a safe place at that time, I don't think. So that's a little funny video that we, we made for... 
um, just reference purposes, but we weren't kidding. This used to happen. This is how they used to light vents. So before development of pilots, the only way to light a flare was to do this, was to have um, either your best archery guy go out there and light a rag on a stick. Somebody, I've even seen videos of people trying to throw rags at shorter flares, and it still happens in today's world when pilots don't operate correctly. So it's very important to have a properly operated pilot on a flare tip. I'm sure Dr. Bokel has given you some history on John Zink, so I won't go into the details of that, but John Zink actually started as a process burner company. Um, in the 1940s, when the US EPA started regulating vinning and requiring flaring, all of our customers came to us and said, can you give us a burner on a stick? And that's basically how the flare industry started. We started putting a burner on a stick to mount on the side of a vent stack, which would then create a flare. If you look real close at the date on this drawing, well, that doesn't show up there. It's around 1948. So right around that time is when John Zink became a flare company as well as a burner company. Supply of pilots marked the beginning of the flare industry in a nutshell. So modern day flaring, it's when they switched vents from flaring, it was very simple. You have a very simple pipe in the middle that's considered the flare tip. And then the pilots were mounted on the side. So these are pilots very early style pilots. Of course, they're much more developed than today, but we still sell pilots that look like that sometimes also. What's the objective of flaring? The main objective is that any process gas that comes from process units, we need to safely relieve it and not overpressure the vessel. If you overpressure a vessel, you have catastrophic consequences such as explosions, which have been heard of in the news if it's not properly designed. The flare is the last line of safety in the refinery or chemical plant to make sure that any of those gases can relieve to the flare safely. So we want to be sure that flares are at all times safe. Effective flaring is a little bit differently. We'll get into the discussion of smokeless flaring. Most gases are going to smoke because they have hydrocarbons, and as those hydrocarbons begin to crack, they form carbon particles, which is soot, which is basically smoke. So Chris is going to talk a little bit more about effective flaring on Thursday. I'm mainly going to talk about the safety features of flaring today. So safety wise, we want to be sure that the flare lights. We have proper flare ignition. We want to be sure that the flare is sized properly. It has proper relief capacity. Um, any liquids going to the flare, we want to try to separate those as much as possible. And I'll show you why in a little bit. Thermal radiation is a huge thing that comes from flares. I know you guys have all sat next to a fire. You feel the heat come off of it. It feels pretty good, right? Especially on a cold day like today. But with this massive amount of gas that's going to a flare stack, it can be very critical safety, can cause a lot of damage, um, can hurt you very quickly if you're not in the proper radiation zone. And then also we want to prevent flashback that goes to a stack. And I'll let Chris talk about the performance stuff later. So a simple pipe flare like I talked about earlier, it meets the requirements of safety. So it can safely relieve the process without overpressuring your system. Um, there is radiation, but you can still make it safe if you make it tall enough. Um, so it's, it meets all those safety requirements. It has pilots, so it's safe for igniting it. Now, it's not very effective, right? Why would you say it's not effective? A lot of soot. A lot of soot forming, okay? There's a lot of health issues that come from soot. It's not very pretty to look at. It's not very aesthetically pleasing to look at. We get a lot of complaints. So a smoky flare is not very effective. So in order to have safe and effective flaring, we really need a smokeless flare as well. And there's multiple ways to make a flare smokeless. Um, another critical factor in today's environment is there's new scrutiny being placed on flares. There's a lot of new regulations that are happening in the flare world. Um, if you need some good nighttime reading or you have trouble going to sleep, <laughs> you can go Google um, flare regulations. and. It gets really in depth, but there's, it's, it's a pretty simple when it comes down to it, but industry worldwide, um, depending on where you guys want to go with your career, if you were to start at a petrochemical plant or a refinery, these are things that are hitting the industry very hard, and John Zink's working very hard to help those people meet these requirements. So, so let's start with talking about flare ignition. I talked a little bit about pilots, but let's talk about the fundamentals of them, ignitions, and flame detection methods. I'm gonna grab my water, sorry. I'm fighting a cold, so if you hear my voice cracking, 
So we have a flare school at John Zink and I teach the pilot section. So this is one of my passions, but I like to say the pilot is the most important piece of equipment on the flare system. Why would I say that? What's a flare system if we no longer have a pilot? We go back to being a vent, right? It's no longer a flare system at that point. So it's very, very critical to have proper operational pilots, ignition systems, and to make sure that those are lit at all times with detection systems. Some important things to consider about a flare pilot design and operation. It's basically a premix burner. Have you guys heard about burners? Yes. I'm sure you've already heard great detail about it. <laughs> so it's basically a premix burner on a stick. We want to make it be sure that fuel and air is regulated in proper amounts. It has to be mixed at the right time. If it's mixed too early, you could have flashback. If it's mixed too late, it's not stable enough. We have to shape the flame. And another thing that's pretty critical on pilots is we need to maintain the flame stability, especially in windy conditions, because these are open to atmosphere, not in an enclosed heater like burners are. So pilot fundamentals, the components of a flare pilot, how does a pilot work, and what are the key goals for a properly designed pilot? Let's talk about the three major components of a flare pilot. You have the pilot tip assembly up top, you have the downstream section or piping section, which is made up of the fuel gas lines and the ignition lines. And then you have the mixer assembly at the bottom, which is made up of the mixer, the orifice, and the strainer. So the middle section, which is the fuel gas lines, is made up of ignition lines. So these are ignition lines. And then this middle part is where the fuel and air mixture is coming up to the pilot. And then the bottom section is the mixer section which is the fuel strainer. So this strainer is basically catching any debris that's coming up in the fuel gas line because there's an orifice here. And this orifice is very tiny. It's around a sixteenth of an inch. So it's very critical to catch any debris that's coming up the line. There could be scale from the line if it's an old line. It could just be debris in the gas. So it's critical to have a strainer directly before this orifice to protect it. Because if you plug that, you cut off your fuel source and you no longer are able to get fuel to your pilot. So the mesh, as the gas comes through, it catches any debris that might be in that gas. That gas is then, at a certain pressure, sent to the orifice. It creates a jet. And so this is open to atmosphere. And as that jet creates, this is basically a simple venturi. And that air and fuel are mixed. So from that point on, you have an air and fuel mixture designed for a proper operation of the pilot. That air and fuel mixture reaches the pilot tip at the top. So this pilot tip is also pretty critical in ensuring that you have a stable flame at all times. And then the windshield is there to protect it in high wind scenarios. So that air fuel mixture comes up and burns out the pilot tip. It also burns back here in our hood, as we call it, um, creates a stable flame back there in your pilot hood. So if your main flame is burned out at any time or blown out, it relights automatically from the stabilization flame in the back. Any questions on that before I move on to ignition systems? Okay, you guys feel free to stop me at any time. I didn't say that earlier, but. Um, we have three different types of pilot ignition systems. The flame front generator is one of the oldest ways to light a pilot and it's still very reliable. It's just pretty maintenance heavy. Then we have two electronics types of ele ele electronic ignition systems to light the pilots. So the first one is flame front generator. Um, I like to say that you're basically laying a fuse all the way from grade up to the pilot, and a spark, a flame ball, actually travels all the way up a one inch diameter ignition line to the pilot and lights. So it's called flame front because the flame actually moves through the pipe all the way up to light the pilot. So you have a air gas line up top and a fuel gas line over here, and the air and fuel mixes and travels all the way up to your pilot. So there has to be a one inch diameter line that runs all the way up there. Once you've allowed enough time for that gas fuel mixture to reach the top of the pilot, you actually spark it and it follows the fuse all the way up to the pilot. So pretty simple, light fire with fire, right? There's a spark plug that's installed directly down here. The key part of this one is that you have to keep the lines maintained and you also have to allow enough time for that fuel and air gas mixture to reach all the way up to the pilots. So there's another view of a conventional FFG panel. <coughs> You've got the air line, 
There's usually some needle valves to help control the pressure of the air. It's very important for the air and fuel gas mixture to be mixed at the right amounts. You have a pressure gauge, orifice, and you have all the same stuff on the fuel gas side. So needle valve, pressure gauge, and orifice to make sure that you get the proper amount of air and fuel mixing. The mixing tee, and there's the spark plug I talked about. So those are all the key components of the FFG system. And then the controls are up here in the ignition box up top. So you just push that button, creates the spark, and it follows the flame front all the way up to the pilot. <coughs> There's also a sight port, a sight port, so you can actually watch it spark on the front of the panel. Usually, the velocity of that flame ball traveling through is over 100 foot per second to reach up to the the pilot. So it happens pretty quickly, especially if you're not very far away. Um, so two different types of spark ignition. These are much simpler to operate. Basically, you just turn a button on and it works. <laughs> so our customers really like these because it's much simpler. Um, the issue with these is these are up at the pilot tip, so you can't change them until you have a turnaround on a flare, which can be sometimes five to seven years between turnarounds. So it has to be very reliable to last that long. So the first one is slipstream ignition system. So if you remember, we have a fuel and air gas mixture coming up the main fuel gas line. We actually have a small slipstream that runs over to a secondary ignition line and that fuel air mixture travels up to the pilot at all times. But we have a spark plug, spark probe that's inserted in this line and it acts as a mini flame front generator. So at all times, anytime you have fuel going to the pilots, you have a fuel and air gas mixture slipping over there. And so you create a simple spark there and it acts as a mini flame front to travel on up to the pilots. The last one is our direct spark system, or as we call it, Instafire. Um, this one is what it sounds like, directly sparking. So it goes directly up into the bottom of the hood, right here. And this is looking at the top view, so you can see the spark probe right there. And so it, it just lights the gases and air mixture as it exits the tip. It's basically just a spark plug. It lights there. The great thing about this one is after it's done sparking, it can actually go to a second mode and detect the pilot also. So you only need one line ran down to the grade to get ignition and detection with this type of ignition. So let's talk a little bit more about monitoring pilots. Why should we monitor pilots? Why do we need to make sure they're lit? Anybody have any guesses? For one thing, for your safety, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure, first of all, that the, the pilots are lit at all times because if the pilots aren't lit, then the vent gas probably isn't lit or it's gonna go out at some point. The second part is the law. Um, actually, per US EPA 40 CFR 60.18, you you're required to have a pilot, a lit pilot on each flare, and you have to prove that pilot is lit um, through use of a thermocouple or some type of equivalent device. So let's talk about different ways you can detect your pilots. Um, there's four components that flare pilots put off that we can detect. Heat, ionized gases, light, and sound. So all of those things are methods we can use to monitor the pilots. The first one being heat, which is a thermocouple. Very simple. It's installed into a pilot hood. We actually cast in a thermal well into all of our pilot hoods. So it helps, keeps it protected. Um, typical temperature we see on pilots is around 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it stays pretty warm up there at all times. We usually put a set point that if the pilot is to go out, and once it reaches that point, it alarms and tries to relight itself at around 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, most of our pilots are type K with stainless steel sheathing. Some disadvantages for the thermocouple is that you can only replace these when the flare tip is down, which like I said, is around every five to seven years. Depending on the thermocouple, you can have a short life, shorter lifespan than that, um, especially if it sees a lot of flame pull down from the flare tip itself. Um, and they do take a little bit long to respond. So you, it could be five to 10 minutes before you know your pilot's out. And then you have to send an operator out to relight it. Um, can have an out pi outage pilot for a long time and that's stuff that has to be reported to the EPA. So um, quick response time is pretty critical. The next one is ionized gases or flame ionization. So we actually use a flame ionization rod, which is the Instafire I talked about earlier. So there's some chemistry behind here and I am not a chemical engineer, I'm mechanical, so <laughs> apologize if I don't get that totally clear. But there's a area of ionized gases when the flame is present and it basically creates some ions to react with and that allows 
the current to pass from the rod back to ground. So if there's a flame there and we send a small amount of electro or current to the pilot nozzle, it actually creates that ground and it'll create the circuit. So it gives you the signal back that the pilot's still lit. So in a nutshell, that's how that works. The benefit of this is it's much faster. So you can imagine as soon as that flame goes out, the ionized gases go away and it tells you it's out right away versus the thermocouple, which takes five to 10 minutes to tell you that it's out. So that's basically what the graph is telling you, even though it's hard to read. Um, but if you wanna look at it a closer, basically we've started both of these pilots at the same time. We let them warm up. Um, right away, the InstaFire tells you it's lit. Thermocouple tells you around, takes around 30 seconds to show you it's lit. We turn both of them off at around 90 seconds. Right away, the InstaFire shows you it's out. It starts to relight itself, it relights, and around 10 seconds later, you've already got a signal back. With the thermocouple, because it's in that thermal well, it's actually even still heating up. So the temperature still trends upwards for about 20 more seconds before it starts to drop. And it takes around five minutes before it hits the set point. So that's just the benefit of the InstaFire fast response over a thermocouple. Two other things we can use on pilots is light. Visibly seeing a pilot is a little bit tricky. Does anybody know what color natural gas burns whenever you burn it premixed? Blue, right? Pretty blue clear. On a flare stack that's around 300 foot up in the air and you're trying to see a blue flame against the blue sky, it's a little bit hard to visibly tell a pilot's lit. So we don't really recommend that as your main detection method. There's a few tricks to make it easier you can use um, if you really need to do that as a last method detection, um, but that's not something we recommend to start with. And there are also some IR cameras out there that are ways to detect too. Um, but they're still not totally reliable because anytime there's fog or a rainy day like today, it's all visible detection. So if that's in the way, it doesn't detect that very good through there. The other one is sound. Did you know that fire makes sound? Turbulent fire can make a lot of sound, right? So our pilots actually put off a specific sound into that flame front generator line and we can put a microphone at grade in that line and detect that a pilot's lit. So there's a difference in the decibels from a lit pilot to an unlit pilot. So it's also very fast and reactive to use sound in our pilots. Okay, so we talked about flare ignition, we talked about ignition and detection. Um, I'm gonna get into now a little bit of relief capacity and why we need relief capacity and what the flare does for that. So why do we need relief capacity? I talked on this a little bit earlier, but it's very critical for all equipment and plants to have, they have to be protected from overpressure. So anytime there's an upset in those process units, distillation towers, anything like that, the heaters, they have to be able to relieve that gas safely somewhere. If not, it pressures, pressures and builds and eventually overcomes the design pressure of that unit and boom, you have an explosion. So it's very critical for the flare to be there and properly designed to be able to depressurize to it at any time needed. Uh, main considerations you need to look at is that for all possible relief capacities, if you had a fire case and every single unit in your plant was having issues and needed to relieve to the flare, you have to design the flare for those conditions. So for an emergency relief example, you start at the top of the flare tip you have zero back pressure, you're at atmospheric pressure basically. From that point on, you have to count all the back pressure back to the unit. So the flare tip itself, the flare stack itself, has some sort of pressure drop. Let's say in this specific case, it's around one PSIG. You're gonna go on up the flare header. That adds about another pound of pressure. So now you're at two PSIG. Then you probably got some piping and valves, more piping back to your process unit. That adds another pound. Now you're at three PSIG. If that vessel is only designed for two and a half PSIG, do you think it's ever gonna relieve to that flare? It can't overcome the pressure there. So we have to be sure of whatever information is given to us from the clients is right, and we design it properly to ensure that the flares can handle all those situations. And not just one case, we have to think about all the cases that can happen. So it's pretty critical to make sure that those are all designed properly um, to relieve properly to the flare. So basically the sum of any source of pressure drop has to be considered when you're looking at the flare system. It determines the back pressure on the vessels and those all have to be designed for that back pressure. If that back pressure is too high, the relief system relief capacity must be increased. 
that means that we either have to increase the size of the flare tip, increase the size of the flare header to reduce that back pressure to make sure all the gases will relieve properly. Gas liquid separation. Why should we prevent liquid from going to a flare? Flaming rain. Flaming rain. Have you guys already heard about this? A little bit? <laughs> well, maybe I have some better pictures than somebody else. <laughs> So unintentional liquid flaring is not a good thing to have in flare systems, elevated flare systems. Now there are some liquid flares out there that are designed to operate with liquid, but not very many. We want to try to get that liquid out as much as possible. So initially some liquid is not going to hurt, it's going to atomize out to a certain point. You might just see some hydrocarbon smoke billowing from the flare tip. Eventually it starts to drop out and will rain to, to grade. You can see the boat here. He's getting out of there. He doesn't want to be around that flaming rain. He knows better. And then worst case, you can even have pole fires. Luckily, this is somewhere offshore, so there wasn't anybody too close around um, that had any issues with it. Sea life probably was effective at that point. Maybe, hopefully, there weren't any fish too close. But not something we want to see. Um, here's one that's more, uh, no, this one's offshore also, but a little bit more impactful. You can see it rained down all the way to grade. What type of condition do you think that derrick is in after it's seen that flaming rain? Not very good, right? Those derricks aren't cheap either, especially to build offshore. So a lot of equipment damage means a lot of dollars for sure. Luckily, this is pretty isolated, so nobody was around, so that's good. But we want to prevent liquid from going to the flare if we can at all costs. The best way to do that is to do gas liquid separation using a knockout drum. There's three major types of knockout drums out there. The first one being a horizontal settling drum. So the key part of this is basically you need enough resonance time for that gas to slow down enough for those liquids to drop out of the gas into the knockout drum. So you have a mixture coming in that comes into the vapor space, slows down enough to allow the mixture, the liquid to drop to the bottom, and then flare gas itself keeps on and heads to the flare. There's some controls that have to go with knockout drums to make sure that your liquid level doesn't get too high, which is why you have to have the liquid level controller and you also have to have a drain out of the knockout drum. So this one would probably be in the flare header upstream of the flare. We also have vertical drums. So these are pretty low pressure drop. Basically the gas still just comes in and it drops the liquid out to grade. Um, these can be incorporated into the bottom of a stack base so they're a little bit easier to put into a flare system. The problem with these is to keep them low pressure drop, the diameter gets very large and at one, some point we get too large to even ship it. So there's shipping restrictions to go down the road, go down rail, on a boat. So that's usually when we get out of the vertical settling drum is when it gets too large to handle for those conditions. Another one is a cyclone settling drum. So the, it's actually an inertia base. So as the droplets hit the wall, they drop out versus just velocity base. And these can be smaller diameter, but they require a little bit more pressure drop. So we just have to make sure that the system can handle that situation. And there's a summary of all of them. We hit the high notes, so I won't go into details on each of them. Here's the references for that. If you need some more nighttime reading, you might go look it up and research them some more if you're interested. Um, let's go into thermal radiation. I believe Brian Beck came in here and talked in detail about radiation. I think that was a couple weeks ago, wasn't it? So I won't hit too much in depth, but talk specifically about flares. Um, specifically, what is it and why do we care about it? So what is it? We talked a little bit earlier about it. Sitting next to a fire on a cold day like this feels pretty good. Some of you came to our test center, right? Yes. Did you get to see a flare? No. What did you guys go look at? Burners and heaters. Just the burners and heaters. I wish Dr. Bocal would include us. <laughs> um, if you ever get to fill a flare up close, it's pretty impressive. We actually had some clients in last week and we set off a ground flare array. And I've been around a lot of flares in my life, but just to fill that and it was, it was hot. So it was, it's very hot, puts off a lot of heat. You can feel how quickly you want to move away from it. Your body automatically tells you, hey, I don't need to be this close. Let's back up some. So um, depending on the gas, all of these things go into factors. What type of gas is going to the flare tip? the flow rate of the gas, how close you are to it. Um, so all of those are things we consider when we calculate flare radiation. Flare radiation is usually what sets the flare height. So whatever 
allowable limit you can have at grade is usually how you decide how tall the flare, tap, the flare stack's gonna be. And of course, the taller we have to make it, the more it costs. So people wanna keep it as short as possible. So why do we care about it? Radiation can hurt people, right? You have people in plants that are working around the flare. A lot of times it's isolated, but many times there's people in operating units pretty close to it. Um, some, the US Navy actually did some research on flare radiation, right? We got the tough Navy guys. So they actually submitted them to certain radiation and calculated how long it would take them to get different types of burns and also their pain threshold for it. So that's kind of how radiation has been um, checked into the past and calculated. But in 20 seconds at 1600 BTU per hour foot squared, you can get up to first degree burns. And in only 50 seconds, you can get third degree burns. So it can very quickly damage your skin, um, can have a lot of pain from that as well. So remember that 1600 BTU per hour foot squared, which is a really weird unit, I know. Um, but So this is API 521 recommendations. API is just a general industry practice. Many people in the industry try to follow these recommendations. So they're saying at 3000 BTU per hour foot squared, you really shouldn't be in that area without some type of heat shield. So you have to have a heat shield installed if you're gonna be in this area when you're experiencing this radiation. At 2000, you can have emergency actions lasting up to 30 seconds. So that basically means they give you time to get out of there. <laughs> so in this area, you can be there. If an emergency flare starts to happen, you have 30 seconds to get out and you won't get. And this is considering that you're in properly clothed attire. Are we in properly clothed attire today? Remember when you came to JZI and you had to wear these Nomex? So this is properly attired. Your sleeves have to be fully all the way down. Most of the time if you're wearing gloves, that helps. Having a hard hat. So it's ba basically radiation is a point of view thing. So if you can see it, you're feeling the effects. Even if you turn your back and just pull up your collars, that helps protect you from the radiation. So that's what they mean in all these situations. So in 2000, you have 30 seconds to get out of there. 1500, you can be there for around two to three minutes for emergency actions. So not very long either. Maybe if you had to run up there and turn off a valve or something like that and then run back. 500 is acceptable to work in the environment at all times. So I've experienced 500 myself. Maybe on a day like today it wouldn't be too bad, but if it's 100 degrees in Oklahoma weather, I don't really want to hang out there, especially if I'm in Nomex the whole time. So things to think about, and these are things that we ask our customers to think about when they're designing their flare stacks and where people are working around it. So, And none of these are considering sun. So another thing that we do whenever we spec out flare tips is, this is what we call a radiation isopleth. So this is measuring, so here's the top of our stack, here would be the flame coming off of it, and these loops are different levels of radiation. So basically this is how far away you'd have to be to be at 500 BTU for this specific gas case. Of course it changes with each flow rate and each gas case. So best way to look at it, but most of the time we don't include solar radiation. <laughs> Solar radiation adds around another 200 BTU per hour foot squared. So, and you have to think about the wind that you're considering when you're doing radiation as well. All of those goes into the radiation calcs. If you want to do some more reading on radiation, here's some different references. There are lots of different ways to calculation, calculate flare radiation out there. Um, many different studies have done on it. John Zink has a proprietary method that we use ourselves, but there's lots of different ones out there too, if you want to read it further on it. And all of them use different models. So how do we calculate flare radiation? Some use just a single point model. It's not a very good practice because you're just basically looking at the center of the flame and there's a lot more flame all the way around it. There's a multi-point model, which is what the John Zink model follows. So you're keeping points all along the flame and considering all of those. And then there's a solid body model. That one kind of overestimates a little bit because it's considering it as a solid body versus how it truly is, but how much work goes into each one. You have to do a calculation for each point, so maybe the solid body is a little bit simpler. So there's been a pros and cons to each one. Any questions on radiations? Okay. So flashback prevention. Does anybody know what flashback is? I don't think there's a good slide in here that really tells you what flashback is. So I believe you've heard about the flame triangle, right? Yes. 
oxygen, fuel, and then you also need an ignition source. So on a flare, where that comes into point is, of course, at the exit. We have fire, we have a pilot, and we have oxygen in the atmosphere. At very, very low flow rates of gas, oxygen can actually travel back down inside of the flare stack. We've got the fuel there coming from the flare. It's at, you know, very low flow rates. So the gas comes out the top and that mixes and creates a flammable mixture. Eventually it reaches that pilot ignition point. And depending on how far back that oxygen and air are mixed at a flammable point, it can flash back and cause damage to your flare system. Certain levels are okay. So far down the stack is okay. Can handle a little bit of flashback and not cause damage. But if it's allowed to propagate all the way back down that flare stack, all the way back down your flare header, you can cause some significant damage in your process units or into your flare header system itself. So we need to prevent that. And the best way to prevent that is actually to purge. So purging is where we put a significant, not a significant, the proper amount of gas through a flare header or a flare stack at all time to make sure that oxygen is evacuated and kept out of the flare stack at all times. So how do you calculate how much gas you need for each flare stack? There was actually a Amico engineer several, eh, I'd say a couple decades ago, did some research. Um, his name was Husa, and he actually has a paper out on this topic as well if you want to read it. I'm giving you guys lots of reading. <laughs> it's not that interesting. I wouldn't go read it. but um, He created an industry standard for purge calculations. So he did lots of testing on different sizes of stacks. He did different types of gases and figured out what velocity you needed based on the type of gas. Because the type of gas actually affects that purge rate. If you have nitrogen, it's one rate. If you have natural gas, it's another. If you have hydrogen, it's another. All of those different characteristics of the gases goes into the calculation of that purge rate. So he came up with this pretty complex calculation that you put into what type of gas you're using, what size of stack you have, and you can calculate the required purge rate you need. The safety criteria he set is that you need no more than 6% O2 25 foot down from the top of the stack. So if you have a 50 foot tall stack, halfway down that, you can't have more than 6% O2, and that should keep you safe from having a flashback type of event for the type of gas you're using. Now, some gases are have wider flammability limits, like hydrogen. You know, that can react with oxygen all the way down to 4% and still burn. So it's very dependent upon the type of gas you're using. Most people use natural gas or um, nitrogen to purge their stacks, though. And that depends on the stack diameter and then also the density of the purge gas, like we talked about. Some ways to reduce that number even further is if you don't want to have an open stack, there are purge reduction devices out there. This first one is a velocity seal. So it's like a nozzle type restriction in the flare stack. It's usually actually installed in the flare tip right around here. And basically, it, as that purge gas exits, it is sped up as it goes through the nozzle-like restriction. And then the air that's traveling down the side of the flare stack is turned and pulled back out with that fuel gas. So it's never allowed to travel back down into your flare stack down here and mix where it could create a flammable mixture. And because it has the nozzle-like restriction, you need less purge gas than you would with an open flare stack. Advantage is it reduces your purge gas. So purge gas costs the plant money, so they don't want to reduce that as much as possible. The disadvantage is it has a higher pressure drop than just a general open stack. So showing you how it works, you've got the purge gas coming up. Any oxygen, air coming back down is pulled back out with that gas through the nozzle-like restriction. Another type of purge reduction device is what we call a buoyancy seal. Um, we also call them molecular seals. But this one is actually more buoyancy driven, so it separates the purge gas from the air. You have two annual flow reversals, so the flare gas comes up, makes a 180 degree turn, makes another 180 degree turn, and then exits out the flare tip. So you create a seal, depending on your purge gas, right here and right here. If it's a lighter than air gas, you make a seal in one area. If it's heavier than air gas, then you actually make it in another one. So this also reduces your purge rate even further than the velocity seal, but this also increases your pressure drop even further than the velocity seal. So there's trade-offs in this situation depending if you have the pressure available. How does it work? Similar to a P-trap under a sink. Have you guys ever seen one of those, worked on one of those? So it's basically keeping the sewer gas coming back out. It creates a water seal 
It's the same type of thought process here for the molecular seal. Another thing we can do to help prevent flashbacks is actually to install a liquid seal. So this would be in the base of a flare stack down here. And so this is the gas coming from your process vessels. It has to come here and overcome the liquid level. So this liquid level from here to here is creating a back pressure on your flare header that keeps it at a positive pressure. So if there was any type of leaks or anything like that, the gas would want to come out versus pulling in air to your system where you could have flashback type situations. Um, also, it helps. This liquid actually creates a kind of a stop. If you were to ever have a flashback down to here, this liquid will stop it. Fire puts out water in most situations, right? So it helps to stop it and create it, keep it from going back up your flare header. So the gas comes through, liquids, bubbles up, and it goes on up to your flare stack. Um, liquid seals create a lot of other things that you need to. You have to be able to drain out that liquid. There's liquid fill. You have to be able to fill it back up. You have to have a pressure gauge on the system to make sure it's caying at a positive pressure and you're not pulling liquid back into your system. There's, we have to put a skimmer on here. Does anybody know why we might put a skimmer? So write it here at the liquid level. As these hydrocarbons are coming through, they might condense out <coughs> and you'll get some hydrocarbon form on the top of this. And so you skim that out the top so you don't have a flammable mixture in here with your liquid. Okay? And we have to create a loop seal so any of this flare gas is not coming out to atmosphere. It just can't, you can't release it to atmosphere, right? So it's actually coming back into a loop seal that keeps it in here because this creates an another back pressure to keep gas from flowing back out of it. And you have to have a vacuum break on there as well. So if you were to keep liquid come out of here, if this wasn't here, what would happen? It would just drain it, right? It would continue to come out of here and suction out of there. So yeah, it's important to have that vacuum break on there. Any questions on that? Okay. Any questions on anything I talked about? I was kind of fast. I didn't know how long it would take me. <laughs> you guys probably aren't complaining, are you? <laughs> I remember that. Well, what time are you supposed to be done? One fifty. One forty-five. Yeah, really early. But anyways, any questions on flares in general? Chris is going to be here on Thursday to talk more about smokeless flaring too. But I do have these. I did everybody come, or just some people? Just so if some of you, whoever came, want to come get them. But I also have tests. I'm sure I don't want to lay these out. Um, chin. UG10? No. Louise? That's you? Okay. I'm trying not to butcher names, sorry. 